We started yesterday studying uh, the exploits of some brethren that departed from Jerusalem to Antioch, preaching the Lord Jesus to all, both the Jews and the Grecians. We read from verse 19 of Acts 11, and we want to move on in that study today. We saw that as they began to preach the Lord Jesus, the hand of the Lord was with them. And the evidence, the indices of that hand being with them is that great number believed. And they didn't just believe. They turned away from their sins. They turned away from their idols. They turned away from whatever they are facing before. They turned unto the Lord. And God began to show us that the reason why several believers, they don't make progress even when they have believed. They are believers, but they have not turned away from their idols. And we saw several idols that God was, you know, mentioning yesterday. And I hope that you have divorced your affinity with your own idol. You are ready to journey with God, having turned away from your idols and facing him fully. They also turned away from the world system. They turned away from the ways of life that contradicts the word of God. The word system is defined as a way of life that contradicts the word of God. And every human being that is following that way, even if the person is professing that he is born again, is a Christian, whatever he is professing, it doesn't matter. As long as the way of his dressing is contradicting the word of God. For example, listen carefully. God intends that when we dress, we cover our nakedness. In Genesis 3, 21, the Bible said, the Lord God came down to the earth and he made clothes for Adam and his wife and he covered them. That was the second time Elohim is coming to the earth to do a work. The first time he came to the earth to do a work was when he came to make the human body. And after making the human body, he covered it with his glory such that as long as they remain in alignment with him, they won't even know that they were naked. But the moment they disobeyed God and, you know, ate the fruit he commanded them not to eat, his glory departed from them and they now saw that they were naked. They became ashamed. They began to make fig leaves, a kind of cloth that will not cover them. And God saw that even though this man and his wife has made some clothing, but he's not really covering them. And God said, I need to go down to the earth again to walk. Listen, when God was creating goats, a cow, all kinds of animals, all kinds of things, he didn't come down. He spoke from heaven. He said, let there be goats, and there was goats. Let there be fowl, and there were fowl. But when he wanted to make man, he came down. Now, after making man, he went up again. But when man has problem of clothing, he has to come down again, kill some animals, and use their skin to make clothes for Adam and for his wife. Can you imagine how important covering of nakedness is to God that he will leave the glory, leave his throne to come down to the earth to make clothes for man in order to cover. And then you are wearing a cloth that doesn't cover your nakedness. No, that is not the way of God. It's the way of the world. And watch, you know, watch yourself, brothers, sisters, especially when you say you are wedding or you are doing traditional marriage. What kind of clothes do you wear at that spot? Because some of you may be dressing well as a sister. I don't know why people normally change when they want to do wedding or traditional marriage. I don't know why the things that you are not putting on, you want to put it on on the day of your wedding or the day of your... And you are looking differently from who you used to be before. That is hypocrisy. It is double life. You are, you are, you are not trying to show that you, you have one life. The world system, it manifests in marriage. The way of the world in getting married is not the way God prescribed. When they want to get married, they will get into all kinds of sexual immorality before they will now say, okay, we are getting married. No, that's not the way of God. And so many other dimensions and manifestations, their music, you are still watching their, 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 their videos, their movies, and listening to their music, corrupting your soul. What are you learning from these things? The way, the culture of the world system. Re remember, 
There is a sponsor of this way of life. It is called the devil. Jesus himself called him the prince of this world. The God of this world. Second Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4. The God of this world. Somebody is the God of this world. Jesus called him the prince of this world. Is coming. He has nothing in me. John 14 verse 30. The prince of this world is coming. He has nothing in me. He doesn't have his way of dressing in me. He doesn't have his way of, you know, there's nothing about him that is inside of me. And in Romans chapter 12 verse 2, he said, do not conform to the pattern, to the culture, to the custom, to the system of this world. If you are a believer, if you are a Christian, you are not supposed to live your life the way unbelievers live their life. People that doesn't have respect for God's word. People that doesn't have respect for God's way. They can do things the way they like and they wouldn't mind. No, we are not to conform to the standard, to the pattern of this world. We are to be transformed. Say, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So that you will find out what God wants and insist that you must do what God wants. He said, love not the world. 1 John chapter 2 verse 15. Not the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Love not the world, nor the things that are in the world. It's about the heart. You may pretend that I am not a part of the world system, but you love the world. When a lady dress in a way that is not glorifying God, you will be the person that will tell the lady, you are looking fine. Looking fine. What, what do you mean by looking fine? This lady is not looking fine. She is dressed seductively. How can you not rebook her? You are telling her, you are looking beautiful. What kind of beauty is that? Love not the world, nor the things that are in the world. Don't add a voice to a corruption that is in the world system. You know, thank God for reading of the, the, the Bible. If you are following the reading of the Bible, you must have read Galatians chapter 1, I think verse 4 or verse 5 or so that said, because when I was, I, I met that verse since, but I met it recently. Look at that, that scripture. Very, very striking. You know, I was uh, with my wife yesterday when she was reading that. I said, did you see Another kind of deliverance that we need. Look at Galatians chapter 1, verse 4. Yes, verse 4. He say, he say okay, if you start from verse 3, he say, Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sin, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father. There is a deliverance from this present evil world. If you are still loving the world, their music, their video, you, you, it's, it's a matter of the heart. He said there is a deliverance you need. You need to be delivered. You need deliverance. Jesus gave himself for, for our sin. And not just for our sin. That he will deliver us from this world and their way. From this present evil world. Love not the world. This man turned away from the world system. Turned away from the way of their life that is not con you know, conforming to the word of God and they turn unto the Lord. Love not the world. Not the things that... He said, all that are in the world. When you read Bible, read it carefully. All that are in the world. What is all? All that are in the world. Everything you are going to get from worldly movie is lost. One, lost of the eyes. Two, lost of the flesh. Everything as you are watching that movie, at the end of the movie, as you are scrolling from your Facebook page, anything that is of the world in that Facebook, everything you are going to gather at the end of the whole watching is lost of the flesh. All that you will ever get, you can't get purity there. You can't get holiness there. All that are in the world, lost of the flesh, lost of the eyes, and then pride of life. Then you now see how, how the world people are boasting and bragging and the things that, that they value, what makes them proud. It will also enter into you as you are watching them, as you are associating with them. Everything you will ever get from the world is lost and pride. Lost and pride. In verse 17, I'm still quoting 1 John chapter 2, 15 to 17. He said, and the world is passing away with its lust. The world is not going to stay forever. This world will be destroyed with fire. According to 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 10. This world and the works in it will be consumed on the day of the Lord with fire. It is passing away. 
it is going and the loss thereof. He said, but he that does the will of God will abide forever. Is either you are doing the will of God according to the word of God or you are in the world following their way, following their pattern. Listen, if you are not being persecuted by the world, you are of the world. I repeat, if you are not being persecuted by the world, when I talk about the world, I'm talking about all the people now that are following the way of life that contradicts the word of God. They may be your fellow believers, but the way of their own life contradicts the word of God. If they are not persecuting you in that business line, if they are not persecuting you in that class as a student, if they are not persecuting you in, in, in your family, if they are not persecuting you, belong to them. The world will always persecute those who are not of their own. In John 15 verse 18, Jesus was speaking to the disciples. He said, do not be surprised that the world will hate you. He said, before the world has hated you, the world has already hated me. He said, the world will hate you and persecute you because you are not of the world. He said, if you are of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world persecutes you. The world will hate you. So if you are not experiencing persecution from your siblings that are not believers, true believers, you are not experiencing persecution from your classmates that are not believers, true believers, you are not experiencing persecution from your neighbors, from your business colleagues in the same business line that are not be true believers. Excuse me, there is a question mark behind your own Christianity. Persecution is, I mean, the normal natural response of the world to true Christianity. Persecution. Do not be surprised that the world hates you. They will hate you. Jesus said they have already hated him. They have already, and the people that eventually crucified him are even religious people. Yes, that's what I'm telling you. It's not about being religious. It's about whether you are following the word. The word. The word. The difference between word, word, and word is air. Just they sound the same. So the enemy can easily confuse you if you are not careful. Make sure that the way you speak. Make sure that the way you, you, you dress, make sure that the way you are planning to get married, brother, the way you are planning to get married is not the way the world gets married. The things that happen when unbelievers are getting married, why should it happen in your own marriage? Be careful so that God will be glorified and not the world rejoicing and enjoying their lust from that which you are doing. They turned away from their idols. They turned away from their sins. And they turned away from the world system. You adulterer and adulteresses. James 4 verse 4. Don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? He said, therefore, anyone that makes himself a friend of this world, anyone that chooses to be a friend of this world, makes himself an enemy of God. You don't, you don't just decide what you want to be. What you are doing makes you what you are. You, you may say, eh, but I'm not an enemy of God. The word of God has already concluded you as an enemy of God. As you are admiring the worldly way of dressing, as you are watching their videos, as you are watching their film, listening to their songs secretly, because some of you will not do it when brethren are there. But in the secret, or when you are alone, you are visiting some sites. Excuse me, you are an enemy of God according to the Bible. You adulterer and adulteresses. Know you not that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. The world is God, God's enemy. The reason is simple. The prince behind the system is God's arch enemy, Satan himself. They turned away from their sins. They turned away from their idols. And they turned away from the world system, their, their way of life. And they are now facing God. That was the secret behind their spiritual progress. Why are we dwelling on this, this particular scripture? Because this is where many, many believers miss it. They wonder, why is it that I am not growing? I want to carry power. I want to manifest Jesus. This is the missing link. At the point of your salvation, you will not turn away from things 
that will limit and stop and hinder you from progressing. And then you enter, you say you are in the race. But there are things that are weighing you down. The word system is one of them. Now go back to Acts chapter 11. Let's journey further in our study. Verse 21 is what we have concluded. Then let's look at verse 22. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. Tidings of these things, news of the things that happened in Antioch. How these brethren preached the Lord Jesus to the Grecians and the hand of the Lord working with them granted that many of them repented and turned unto the Lord. The news about that spread and got to the church in Jerusalem. And when they heard the news, they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. First of all, I want us to pick a lesson from that instance. If you remembered Acts chapter 8 verse 14, please read Acts chapter 8 verse 14. Now, when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and what? And John. They sent unto them Peter and John. Now, I want to, there is a pattern I am seeing in these two verses. They sent Peter and John. They sent Peter. They sent Barnabas. So what is the meaning of this? The church is an authority. Remember, Peter, as of that time, is seen as their leader. Are you following me? And John is one of the prominent apostles. When they heard that Samaria has received the gospel, they, they sent you know what it means to send somebody? They send somebody to go. When, when I send you to go and represent me, you are going with my what? Authority. They sent Peter and John. Now, in this case, they sent Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. Now, before we look at why they did that, let's look at what they did. They sent Barnabas. They sent Peter and John. What I want us to pick from here is the authority of the church. What is the church? Always remember that the church is not a denomination. The church is not those who are meeting on Sunday morning. Jesus' own definition of, the, of, of his church is as simple as Matthew 18, 20. Where two or more are gathered together in my name, here I am. We are in their midst. That would be a teaching for another day. But for now, I want us to see that this body of believers called the church, there's an authority. Eh? There's an authority that every individual in the church, you have to submit yourself to the authority of the church. That the church can pick you and say, you Come, we are sending you to Oji River. And you, knowing that the authority of the church is the authority of the Christ himself. Knowing that disobeying the church is disobeying Christ. Please, Mark, don't be confused when I call the church. Because I know where your mind is going. The church is not just a religious organization or a building. The church, wherever two or more are gathered together in my name, that is the church. Are you following me? Yes. 
Now, when we are in a, in a, in a fellowship like this, don't make mistake and saying this one is a fellowship, this one is a church, this one is a ministry, this one is a that that is nonsense. What did I call it, please? It doesn't have sense at all. The church of Jesus Christ is the body of believers that are you know in a locality that are working together with one common goal to glorify Jesus in a locality where where two or more are gathered. Where two or more so there's a place where two or more are gathered in my name i am there now this church as they gathered together they have an authority that they can say to each of the members do this and that is why you see i was talking to a brother one day who will always say eh, the reason why i did not attend a, a, a council meeting of the church is that i have this personal program I have the other personal program. I say, excuse me. If you understand the church and the authority of the church, all the personal programs comes under. Are you getting it? It is only when the church is free, when the, the body is free, that you can have your own program. Are you getting me at all? I want you to see Peter and John coming under the authority of the church submitting under the authority of the church and the church sent them to Samaria and they didn't say, I, I don't like to go to Samaria. I won't go to Samaria. In fact, I don't have chance now. In fact, um, uh, it's not convenient for me. In fact, uh, have you forgotten that I have a wife? Eh? My children, uncle? Peter would have begun to talk like that. But the moment the church decided that it is Peter and John that we go to Samaria, they submitted and obeyed the church. Are you following me? In this case, again, they say, Barnabas, come. We want to send you. The Bible says they sent Barnabas. The reason why I'm dwelling on this is that many of us don't understand this authority. We disobey it at will. Maybe some of us understand, but we don't understand the implication of disobeying the church. When it is the, 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 the church that is sending you, you don't see the authority. And so you are giving excuses. You are saying that eh, I have this personal program. Let me ask you a question. Barnabas obeying the church and going to Antioch, does he have personal agenda in Jerusalem? This is where he has been living all this while. From the Pentecost day, do you know how many months or years they have spent there? He doesn't have any plan about uh, Antioch. He, he doesn't have any. And the, the church says, Barnabas, come. We are sending you. And he said, here am I, send me. I don't, I don't know whether you're getting me. You must see the, the authority of the church as the authority of Christ himself. You know why? This is the body of Christ. This is what? The body, the body of Christ is not different from Christ. That was why Jesus said to Saul, why are you persecuting me? Because the church that you are persecuting is my body, it's me. So when you disobey this body, when the, 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 the act bearers come together and they say, we are sending you to go and do this. And you stand up and say, excuse me, I don't think I have time to go and do that. No. You are missing it. See, you must see this as the final. I was surprised that Peter, the chief of the apostles, will have to submit himself to the authority of the church. There is no individual, no matter how highly placed you are, no matter your title, your anointing, that rises above the authority of the church. No, it's true. They sent forth Barnabas. Now, let's look at, if you have understood that aspect, let's look at why did they send forth Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. Now, that phrase, as far as, is already showing us that Antioch is very far from Jerusalem. Barnabas, again, did not complain about the distance. Because for some of us, the complaint will not be that I will not go, but that the place is too far. Am I saying the truth? It's true. Why are you sending me? It's too far. If I say to you now, I'm sending you to MNE to go and you know, start discipleship class there, or we are going to MNE to plant a discipleship center there, and then you are going to... It's too far. Can I take where it is close? No, you are missing it. They sent forth Barnabas as far as Antioch. And then, the reason, why did they do that? 
They heard that these people have repented. They heard that God has moved in this place. And their natural response was to send forth Barnabas. Why? Why are they sending forth Barnabas? The reason is very simple. The truth is that what actually led to these brethren that preached the gospel in Antioch to leave Jerusalem was persecution. They were not planning to go. Persecution led to their departure from Jerusalem. And because they departed unplanned, the truth was that the brethren at Jerusalem must have asked questions and say, who and who were involved in the preaching and the winning? Though they were happy that people repented, but they want to find out whether the people that preached the gospel to the souls that repented were capable enough to follow them up, to disciple them, to teach them, to observe everything that the Lord has commanded. Remember, Jesus commanded them and said, Go into all the world and make them to be my disciples. Baptize them. But not only that. Teach them to observe everything. All that I have commanded you. Now, when they make you a disciple, they will have to sit you down to teach you all that the Lord has commanded and insist that you ob obey and observe them. Possibly, these brethren that left from Jerusalem to Antioch must have maybe not completed their basic discipleship lessons and classes. There are, you know, the persecution rose up without notice. So possibly, these brethren are still undergoing their discipleship. They are still being followed up. But the persecution truncated it. Are you getting it? So they moved out of Jerusalem impromptu. And there are some gaps in their life that even though they have won souls, if you leave the souls that they have won in their hand to disciple, they will not be able to disciple them because no man has the capacity of giving what he doesn't have. The life of Christ has not matured in them. Galatians 4.19, my little children, of whom I travel in bed again until Christ is formed in you. What is that apostle saying in that verse? He said, my little children, I have traveled for Christ to be formed in you before. He didn't form. Now I have entered into the second dimension of travel. And this time around, I will not stop until Christ is formed in you. That is the goal of this second travel is to ensure that before I stop traveling, Christ must have been formed in you. The truth is that this Galatians that Paul was talking about are born again. They are believers. But Christ is not formed in them yet. The fullness of Jesus is not yet being expressed by their life. They need someone like Paul to begin to travel. This traveling level is not just prayer. It's also teaching. Teaching and praying. That's why he's writing the letter again. And as he's writing the letter again, he's praying for them and he's trying to open their eyes to see that Christ must be formed in their life. Amen. Now, I want you to note that the brethren that followed persecution, that moved as, as a result of persecution to Antioch and preached the gospel, what the, the, the church discovered was that Christ was not yet fully formed in them. And if you don't have Christ fully formed in you, you will not also fully form it in others. So they have to send forth Barnabas, the man that they believe that Christ is fully formed in him. So that when he gets to Antioch, he will both begin to follow up, begin to disciple the, the new souls that we are won and the soul winners that won them. Are you getting me at all? Now, you need to see the value. We call it core values of the church. It's a culture too that they don't just you know, win souls and leave the souls have baked. They labor. Their interest is not just that the number increase. Their interest is also that this number that increase, Christ will be formed in them. So they devise strategies to labor over the life of the new convert until Christ is formed in the new convert. So one of the strategies here is to send Barnabas. Those, so they, when they send Barnabas, they, they are sending Barnabas with the goal that Barnabas will go there as a discipler that will disciple both the preachers and the souls that they were. 
in order to preserve the, the life of Christ, in order to preserve the testimony of Christianity, so that it will not be that they say these people are born again, they are believers, but there are deficiencies all over, because nobody who is fully matured has worked and labored in their life to ensure that Christ is fully formed in their life. This is what the church, the present day church has missed. So many activities are going on. Programs are going on. But the discipleship of lives, the maturing of life to ensure that Christ is fully formed is not being paid attention. So the activities of the, 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 the different local churches and groups is around miracles, signs, wonders, but the maturing of the people. Listen, are you following me? You know, and you see, people, there is something that the people want. If you are a spiritual leader or a Christian leader, you must be careful never to follow the voice of the people, never to follow the needs of the people. Because when you want to do what people want, you will never ever please Jesus. Paul said in Galatians 1 verse 10, if I have wanted to be pleasing to men, I will never be a servant of God. Men want things. There are things that th brings them to church, brings them to program. For example, let me give you an example. There are people that, you know, if 40 days of power is prayers all through, and then prophetic declaration, and then miracle services all through, you will see people that will be following it every day. Every day. But the moment they discover that there is a teaching of the word of God that will begin to affect their life, begin to change their life, begin to transform their life, begin to mature them. You see, some of them say, I'm not interested in this. They will, they want, all they want is, give me fish, give me bread. Eh? That's all I want. I need miracle. I need prayer. I need uh, uh, breakthrough. I need this. I need that. That's the reason more than 70% of present day people that go to church, they go to church because of what they are going to get from the church. Am I saying the truth? Yes. And the pastors also know that this is the reason why the people are coming to church. So what do they do? They organize anointing service, breakthrough service, all kinds of services, miracle services, just to attract the people and keep them around that their needs. The question is, is that what God wants? Are you getting it? There is nothing wrong if people receive miracles. Jesus gave people miracles. But he took time to train and teach the disciples. Sometimes he will sit down on the mountain. And for a long while, he will be teaching them deep things about the life, the culture of the kingdom. To be able to mature his life in the people. What the early church upheld, their culture which we are trying to recover by studying the book of Acts is what is taking us to pay attention to this matter. When they heard that Antioch people have believed, they say, that is good, but that's not good enough. We need to do something to ensure that they don't just become half-baked believers. They are groomed. They are discipled. They are followed up to come to the point where Christ is fully formed in them. Who will go for us? And they checked and they noticed that Barnabas has made some level of progress that will enable him to sit over these lives. And Christ formed in him can also be formed in the people. And they say, Barnabas, come. You are going to Antioch. When you get to Antioch, the preachers that preached the gospel, they were undergoing their own discipleship before persecution truncated it. Now when you get there, sit them down too. Ensure that Christ is also formed in them. Then the souls that they won, you also do the same work in them. So that the church of Christ that is being bettered in Antioch will represent Christ. Is somebody following me at all? This is what the, the early church upheld. They didn't joke with it. Why this deviation in our time? You know, when we are talking about revival or revival labels, you must understand what revival is and what revival labor is. We must bring back the core values of the church. The core values of the church is not just that the crowd will fill everywhere and then they are uh, being told to pay their tithe, give their offering and all of that. No. It is that the life of Christ be fully formed in the men, in the people. He gave some to be apostles. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 12. He gave some to be prophets. So evangelists. Verse 11, yes. 
He gave some to be pastors and teachers. Why? He said, so that they will equip the people of God, they will prepare them for the work of the ministry. So that the body of Christ will be built up. That will no longer be children. The reason why these gifted men were released to the church was so that we will no longer be children. Children, not physical children, spiritual children. The reason why they have to send Barnabas to Antioch is so that the souls that are won and the people that won them will not remain as children. They will mature. Ephesians 4 verse 13, that will no longer be children. Tossed to and fro, that's one thing about children. They are tossed to and fro with every wind of the doctrine. He said, but we will be able to grow unto the measure of the fullness of the stature of Christ. He said, speaking the truth in love, verse 15, we will grow up into him in all things. Now, this is the culture. This is why Barnabas was released. To go as far as Antioch. To sit over the life of these people that repented and the people that preached to them. So that by the reason of sitting over their life, you will be able to ensure that they mature in the faith and become people that God can also trust to disciple others. Now listen, let's look into our discipleship families carefully and ask yourself, you know, when you say, God, give us 1,000 disciples, you need to ask yourself, who will disciple 1,000 disciples? Before 1,000 disciples is given to you, if they are going to be disciples, if there will not be crowd, are you following me? You will need at least 200 sound disciples. I repeat, if you don't have up to 200 sound, matured disciples in whose life Christ has been formed, you can't have effective 1,000 disciples. At least when you divide 1,000 by 200, what do you get? Eh? At, at least each disciple should be able to handle five or four disciples and handle it for them to grow and also become disciples. Because see, the goal of Jesus is not that we should become disciples. The goal is that we should become disciples. Let's look at the Great Commission once again. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go into all the world and make them to be my disciples. Baptize them. Then teach them to observe everything I have commanded you. Part of what he has commanded is that they should go into the world to make disciples. So part of what you are going to teach the disciples you have met is also what? How to go into the world. So you are not just making a disciple. You are making what? A disciple that will also join you in going into the world. So in that command, what Jesus is actually telling the disciples is go into all the world and make people not just disciples but disciples. So the way of growth in disciple making the way of growth of the church is raising of disciples that are Christ-like, that are already matured in the life of Christ. So that with the life of Christ matured in them, when I'm talking about life of Christ matured in you, you must look at it holistically. You must look at it in the area of your, you know, when, when you see somebody who is matured, you will see it in self-control. Self-control. A little thing, you flare up, you get angry, you, you, you flee from one emotion to another. You see it in love. You see it in joy, in peace, in patience. You see it in meekness, meekness. A meek man does not quarrel or fight his own battle. He allows God to fight for him. You see it in goodness. You see it in kindness. A kind man is someone who is not just interested in his own happiness, but in the happiness of others, especially those that are around him is caring enough to find out that this person is not happy like yesterday. What is happening to you? You need to be happy. And you begin to do something about it. We call it kindness. Matured life of Christ is expressed in the fruit of the Spirit. Not only that, fullness of his power too. Because when you read the next verse, the Bible says that Barnabas, I think verse 23 or 4, he said he was, full, he was a good man. That is a man of good character. And then full of Holy Ghost and power matured. Amen. Amen. Now, look at verse, I think we have to move on to verse 23 and see how much we can touch that verse before we conclude for today. Verse 23. 
Are you there? You are not answering. Are you there? Let's read it together. One to go. Who, when he came, that's when Barnabas came, and had seen the grace of God, was glad, and exhorted them all, that with purpose of heart, they would cleave unto the Lord. Now, this is very important for us. In the remaining few minutes we have, I hope we'll be able to talk about it before we pray. The Bible says when Barnabas came, he saw something. He saw the grace of God. Grace of God is not visible. But what the grace of God is doing in a man's life can be visible. So when the Bible says he saw the grace of God, what he's referring to is he saw what God, because the, the, the grace of God is actually God at work. He saw what God has wrought in the life of these people in converting them in, you know, because the Bible said the hand of the Lord was with them. So he saw that the grace of God that bringeth salvation has truly appeared to these people and has truly saved them. He saw that they are not just saying, I am born again, I'm saved. They are, they are truly saved. They have turned away from idol worship. They have turned away from so many things, world system. They have turned away from their sin. The grace of God has really and truly worked in their life. He was glad. He was happy. But he also noticed something. The Bible says, please pay attention. He exhorted them. He, 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 he spoke to them. The word exhort has to do with preaching, warning, or talking to somebody in a very serious way. He exhorted them that with purpose of heart, they should cleave to the Lord. This is very serious. Barnabas noticed that these brethren, by the grace of God, they have believed the gospel. They have submitted themselves unto the lordship of Christ. One. Two. Barnabas noticed also that by the grace of God, they have turned away from their saints, idols, and world system, and they have turned unto God. But Barnabas also discovered that they are not yet cleaving or cleaved to the Lord. So he now knew that one thing that I need to tell them, because I can't start telling them to give their life to Christ. They already settled in that area. I can't tell them that they should, I mean, turn away from their idols. They have already done that. Now, the only thing I need to tell these people is that as me, Barnabas, has cleaved to the Lord, they, with purpose of heart, should what? Cleave to God. Are you following me at all? I want to see Barnabas' message to the people. Barnabas' message to the people is not on, on repentance. Barnabas' message to the people is not on turning away from sin. It's not on, you know, believing in Christ. His message to the people is what? On cleaving, cleaving to the Lord. In other words, you see, you can't be telling them to cleave when they have, not, when they have cleaved. They have not cleaved. That's the difference between being a disciple for now and being a disciple for life. You know that these people have become disciples. They, are, they have believed. But he's not telling them. You need to cleave to the Lord. Cleave. Now, if you check dictionary on what cleaving means, that's why I'm opening my book because I wrote it down. He said to cleave is to be joined, one, glued, two, and interlocked together. Interlocked together. In such a way that separation is not possible without tearing a part of the other. Three things. One, to be joined. Eh? You know, I can join my hands like this. That is cleaving, but it's not yet cleaving enough. Now, when I join my hand, I get super glue. You know glue? Glued. I use it to glue the two hands. I get in it. And then interlock is what I have done now. This is interlock. Interlock. If I join it this way, it's not interlock. But if this way, it's interlock. I get it. Now, interlocked, glued, and joined. Now, when you have put it this way, with super glue, and you want to separate these two hands, what will happen? You must tear it. It's, you can't separate the two anymore. Cleaving is the uniting together that makes the two to become one entity. No shaking or vibration, no matter how violent, can separate the two again. 
Barnabas encouraged them. Barnabas exhorted them to cleave to the Lord. To join themselves to Jesus in such a way that it is impossible to separate them from Christ without killing them. If you want to separate brother Michael from Christ, if brother Michael has cleaved to Christ, there is only one way to do that. You have to kill him. If you don't kill him, you cannot separate him from Christ. Is somebody getting me at all? See, this is where we are ending this morning. The truth is that why we see backsliding of believers is because several believers at the point of their salvation, they have not cleaved. So Barnabas began his ministry among the Antioch believers by ministering at the point of cleaving. He carefully observed them. He noticed that in believing, no deficiency. In turning away from their sins and idols, no deficiency. But there is a deficiency in this aspect of cleaving. They are disciples for now, but I'm not sure whether they are going to be disciples for life. I'm not sure that in the next two years, they are still disciples here. I'm not sure that in the next five years, they are still standing. I'm not sure that in the next 20 years, they will be standing. Oh, this sister is doing well. She is a disciple. Am I sure that after her marriage, with all the things that goes on these days in the wedding of people and traditional marriage, and then she will begin to bear children after 10 years of marriage, that she will still be a disciple, a sister in the Lord, cleaved to the Lord. We have seen this happen again and again. We are people, brothers, sisters. You now ask about what about this brother? Say, ah, he's in America. What about his spiritual life? He has backslidden. He has traveled. See, when a man has cleaved to the Lord, your travel to anywhere does not affect your relationship with God. To be joined in such a way that there is no breaking anymore. There is no separation again. You cannot separate two persons that have truly... You know, the word cleave was used first in Genesis 2 when God was talking about marriage. He said, therefore, shall a man leave his father and his mother and what? And cleave to his wife. Cleave to his wife. In other words, there must be a living. And the truth is that these brethren, they have tried. They have left idols. They have left the world system. They have left. So Barnabas is saying, when you have left all these things, you now have to what? Cleave. Join yourself to the Lord Jesus that even when there is no money in your pocket, you will not backslide. Even when you have searched for a job for 10 years, no job, you will not backslide. Sister, you are looking for a husband, somebody to marry you, and you spent 15 years, and you are now 40 years, 45 years, and nobody is coming, you will not backslide. That sister has cleaved. She has said, what shall separate me from the love of God? That is in Christ Jesus. Shall tribulation? Shall distress? Shall marriage? What is it? Paul said, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, angels, principalities, no force. Oh my God. Are you following me at all? He said, principalities, they can't try it. They may attack. They may fight. They may do but They can't separate me from the love of God. These are men that has cleaved. He said, I am persuaded. He said, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Even sword cannot separate us. He said, but for your sake, we are being killed all day long. Romans 8, 35 to 39. Nothing in this world, present in the future, in the past, can ever come up and separate us from the love of God. Death cannot try it. Are you getting me at all? I remember preaching the gospel to one woman some time ago. And the woman said to me, I have rejected Jesus. I used to be born again before. She told me the story of how you used to be born again. I said, why did you reject Jesus? She said, how can Jesus allow my husband how many uh, uh, months or years of marriage to, be, to, 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 to die? After all the prayers, we pray that she, he will not die. He was so bitter and you know, angry at Jesus and she decided to backslide. <laughs> this kind of people. If you see her before her husband becomes sick, why she's praying and say, Jesus, Jesus, I love you. Lord Jesus, I love you. I will serve you. I will follow you. What is she saying now? Something happened to her because she has not cleaved. Remember cleaving. 
Do you remember cleaving? You have joined yourself to the Lord Jesus. You have not just joined yourself to the Lord. You have glued to him. You are interlocked with him in such a way that you and him has become one. First Corinthians chapter 6 verse 17. He said, but he that has joined himself to the Lord has become one spirit with him. Joined in such a way that nothing can separate you. Are you getting me? Money or no money? Are you getting me? See, listen. Whether the ministry make progress or you didn't make progress, it has nothing to, to affect my relationship with him. Are you getting, you know, there are some people that I remember one video. I don't know whether, I, I think they said that thing is real. A pastor that pastored a church for 15 ye years or so wanted to commit suicide. And they saw him and they rushed him where he is about to hang himself. And they said, why do you want to kill yourself? He said, I've been pastoring this church for how many years now? And only these few people. I've been begging God for breakthrough, begging God for anointing, begging God for... You want to kill yourself? That is to show that that man has not... In fact, he's not even Christ that is his goal. Paul said, my goal is to win Christ and be found in him. It's not just the ministry result. My goal is to win Christ and be found in him. That's my goal. When rapture takes place and I'm in him, I'm going with him. I'm going to stay with him. To win Christ and be found in him is my goal. What is your goal? Money, fame, power, progress. Eh? Eh, eh, what, do you, what do you call it? Breakthrough. And when you don't see them happening, you say, hey, it's like God is partial. No. Have you cleaved to the Lord Jesus? Will you follow him at all costs? Will you follow him despite the fact that things are not going well? Was it not Habakkuk that said, even if the olive tree eh, did not bud, eh, even if this one did not happen, I will still rejoice in the Lord my God. I will not allow my joy to be controlled by the economy of the nation. I will not allow my joy to be controlled by anything. Ruth said to Naomi, entreat me not to go back from following you. Ruth 1 verse 16 and 17. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. Your God shall be my God. Where you die is where I will die. Far be it from me that nothing, eh, apart from death, will separate me and you. That lady cleaved to Naomi and became an example of how we must cleave to Jesus. And Barnabas encouraged them. Barnabas exhorted them and said, Brother, I can see you praising God today. I can see you very happy that you have repented and the joy of the Lord has come into your heart. But see, you need to cleave. Because tomorrow, persecution may come. Tomorrow, distress may come. Tomorrow, tribulation may come. Tribulation. Have you heard about the great tribulation? Eh? If it happens that the Antichrist comes and is now beginning to deal with people, how many people will even stand and say, I'm not going to take the mark of the beast? Eh? Despite the suffering. How many? How many? I'm asking, how many? By the time they say you will not buy or sell if you don't have the mark and you don't have something to eat, what shall separate us from the love of God? That is, he, he said, can hunger do it? He said, in all these things, we are not just conquerors. We are more than conquerors. In all these things, before a sword, we are more than conqueror. Before any kind of distress, any kind of persecution, any kind of what, we are more than conqueror. He said, for I am persuaded. Are you persuaded? Have you come to the point where you are persuaded? Someone like Saul, I mean, in Acts 21, the Bible says that Agabus is one of the most accurate prophets of the time. He has already prophesied that Paul will be bound in Jerusalem. Four daughters of Stephen, I mean um, Philip, four virgins, they have also prophesied. Several prophecies have come. But, you know, before Agabus prophesied, people were not crying. But the moment Agabus, <coughs> Agabus once he prophesied, just go and sleep. Because the matter is concluded. He doesn't speak carelessly. The Bible says, when Agabus finished prophesying, everybody began to cry and say, Paul, we are now sure that you will be bound in Jerusalem. Please don't go to Jerusalem. They were weeping and crying. Paul spoke and said, why are you crying and breaking my heart? His heart was broken, you know, but he's going. His will was not broken. His emotion was affected, but his will was still strong. He said, 
I am going ready not just to be bound but to die. I'm ready to die. What is life if not using it to please Christ? In Philippians chapter 1, he said, according to my earnest expectation, verse 20, he said that in, 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 both now and always, with all boldness, Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. I've not seen a man that is in prison. And when he's writing epistles, he will not be asking the people, please pray for me that I'll come out of prison. He doesn't give it as a prayer point. Go and read all the epistles that he wrote from prison. He, do, he never asks anybody to pray that I will come out of prison. No. He will see them say, please pray for me that I will have utterance during my day of defense. Eh? I will have boldness to be able to you know, fire them very well. Eh? <laughs> With the gospel. Are you getting me? What a man. Cleaves so strong that no suffering, no persecution, nothing at all will ever separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Have you cleaved? Or are you speaking in tongues, chanting today? But in the next five years, they will be looking for you. A little thing will come up. You will start considering to give up your faith. Will you come to the point where you are saying, I am not just a disciple for now. I am a disciple for life. Let me challenge us. If somebody can say, ask now for life. Mind you for life. I mean, these football fans that are just... And they are saying it's for life. No matter how much you score Arsenal, 5-0, 10-0, Arsenal for life. Why can't you be a disciple for, 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 for life? A disciple of Christ for life? Why can't? It's a challenge. Somebody is Arsenal's disciple for life. Despite all the you know, defeat of Arsenal. Yet, Arsenal for life. Why can't you be a disciple for life? What is it that will separate you? from the love of Christ. Why can't you cleave in such a way that separation from Christ is not possible? Whether you travel out of Enugu or you travel out of Nigeria, it doesn't make the difference. Wherever you find yourself, you have cleaved. Rise on your feet and pray. Rise on your feet and pray. Say to God, help me. Help me. I need help. That I will be not just a disciple for now. I will be a disciple for life. I will stand where you are standing. I will not use because of exam and compromise by my faith. I will not use because of marriage. I will not use because of academics. I will not use because of job. Some of us, you will go and give bribe because you want to get a job. You will sleep with a man because you want to have a job. Can you say, God, I am standing with you. No matter the temptation, the tribulation, the distress, nothing, I say absolutely nothing, will separate me from the love of God, from the love of Christ that is in, love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Can you begin to pray?